Thank you for joining us today at our online service from Unity Baptist Church in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, we have been uh, looking at a defense of biblical morality uh, in the last several weeks on our uh, online service as well as our uh, in-person service, which also starts at 1015 on Sunday morning. and. Uh, we would love to have you come and, and join us in person if it's possible for you to do that. Uh, today we're looking at uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14, really through verse 23 of that chapter. And we're talking about walking in newness of life. It's, it is the idea that uh, a biblical idea, I might add, that uh, the believer is to live a different kind of life in this world. Uh, <clears throat> not that, that we're to be weird, I, I don't mean that, but we are to be, as Peter says, we are to be peculiar. We are a, a special people, uh, not in terms of being better than anybody, but someone who is set apart from this world system. That's what we have been saved out of, and that is what we have been sent into uh, to uh, display before an unsaved world the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And, and the question is always, how do you do that? I mean, the pressures of this world are tremendous. The, the pressures of the culture upon uh, the individual are just uh, tremendous, and and the pull of the world upon our lives is <clears throat> is very difficult to resist, and it's very easy to become uh, wrapped up <clears throat> in the things of this world, which many people are, many believers are, and the question is, how do you live a life? that ultimately brings glory to the God who saved you. And I want to talk about that today. You know, as you read your Bible, you can't help but notice <clears throat> that the scriptures convey a, <clears throat> a certain seriousness in how the believer is to live their life in this world. God is serious about your life. God is serious about my life and how it is lived and the kind of testimony that I have in this world uh, with my neighbors, my family, my co-workers, that is very important to the Lord. And he talks about it often. It, it is an approach to life that is not often found in the, the spiritual considerations of the average professing believer in the local church today. Because a lot of people who, who sit in churches where the gospel is actually preached have the view that, that going to heaven is the next logical step in a believer's life after they've been saved. <clears throat> it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, A-C thinking is the way I've heard it described before. It is... It is a, a, a kind of thinking that lives a, leaves a, a lot of spiritual dead space in the life of the believer who holds that particular view. You know, and as I said before, it's, it's A to C thinking. A being, I've been saved. C being, I'm going to heaven. And that's the way a lot of Christian people look at their Christian life. And all of that is well and good, but, but what about the vast space in between that moment that you trust Christ as your Savior and that moment that you, you're going to heaven? The question is, what about B? You know, A, B, C, this, this, uh, this life that we have to live. What about that? You know, most people get saved when they're <clears throat> they're younger, not everyone, but most people get saved when when they're younger, on the younger end of their life. And most people go to heaven at the 
older end of life. And between those two things is a vast period of time that is called life. And, and the question is, how, how do you live that to the glory of God? You know, a lot of people have this A to C mentality and, and apparently think that God went to the furthest extent to save them with no greater objective in mind than to, to get them to heaven when they die, but, but he failed to think through in their, in their thinking, apparently, at least in a practical sense, God failed to think through any purpose for how the rest of our life is going to be lived on this earth. That's silliness. <laughs> it's just silly to think that way. It, it is to betray, I think, an ignorance of God's purpose in saving us in the first place. Because God didn't save us to take us to heaven. Otherwise, he would have taken us to heaven when we got saved. God saved us for another purpose, a greater purpose. And that greater purpose has to do with here and now, right now. In this salvation that he has provided for us, the Lord has, has forgiven our past. And thank God he has. <clears throat> but not only has he, <clears throat> not only has he forgiven our past, but he has also secured our future. So I no longer have to worry about my past. I no longer have to worry about my future in heaven. I have to, to concern myself with right now <clears throat> and how I'm supposed to live my life right now, which explains, I think, why the bulk of teaching in the epistles concerns itself with the living of our lives in the present. That's what the epistles are about. It's about right now. The issues that the churches in, in Galatia or the church at Ephesus or Philippi or Colossae or, or, or wherever else, the issues those people were dealing with in their lives right then. Sure, they were going to heaven. Sure, they've been forgiven of their past sins. But <clears throat> what about right now? In the book of Ephesians, I will get back to Romans here in a minute, but in the book of Ephesians, Paul explains to us why the Lord saved us. And he explains it in chapter one of the book of Ephesians, beginning at verse number three and going through verse number 14. And what he, what he explains to us is the part that each member of the Trinity played in our salvation because they all had a part. The Father planned it, the Son secured it, and the Spirit seals it. But each of them had a part in our salvation, and the question is why? Well, it says in verses three through six <clears throat> that they all had the same purpose in the work of redemption that they accomplished in our lives. And <clears throat> in every single one of them, the, the, the ending phrase is essentially the same, to the praise of the glory of his grace. In other words, God saved you for himself. He didn't save you and me for, for us. <clears throat> he saved us for himself. It was for his praise. It was for his glory. It was because of his grace that you and I are saved. Further on that in that book, Paul explains how God's purpose in saving us is going to be fulfilled through us as we live out the life of Christ that God has worked in us at the moment of our salvation. <clears throat> it is the process <clears throat> of spirit, a process of spiritual growth that he reveals through two prayers that he prays in the book of Ephesians. 
and, and he applies it to the Ephesian believers, but also to us. He began in verse chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, with a prayer for knowledge. There are some things we need to know. If I'm going to grow, if I'm going to accomplish the purpose that God had in saving me, there are some things I need to know. And, and he talks about that in Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. So if I'm going to grow in, into Christ's likeness, if I'm going to, to live a life that brings glory to God, there are some spiritual truths I need to know. I need to mentally comprehend the truths of God's word in his redemption. Paul spoke about this going back to Romans chapter 6. He spoke <coughs> about this in Romans chapter 6, verse number 3, verse number 6, and verse number 9. And, and he talks about knowing the things we've got to know. And, and that's why Bible reading is so important. We need to familiarize ourselves with the truths of the scripture. And then he offered up in chapter three of Ephesians verses 14 through 19, a, a prayer of apprehension. And in verse number 18, he hearkens back to the first prayer and he talks about comprehending the, the facts of God's love. But in verse number 19 of Ephesians chapter 3, he uses the word know again, and he, he uses that word in a different way. It is the idea of apprehending something that we have comprehended. Now, I don't want to get off into the weeds here, but this is very important. In chapter 3, in this prayer that he prays for the people of Ephesus, Paul talks about making the truths that we have comprehended our own. It's the idea of, <clears throat> of reaching up and pulling them down into our life and making it a part of us. <clears throat> this is Paul's appeal in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 11. And the idea is that I need to be becoming what I know. It's, it's not enough just to know it in my head. It's something that has to become a part of me. I have to become what I know. This is what Paul speaks of in, in chapter 6 of Romans in verse number 11, when he, he speaks of reckoning ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin or, or considering it to be so. <clears throat> And as I said just a moment ago, it's not just enough to know the facts. God intends that these spiritual facts change our life. Now, I think that's the problem a lot of times in, in the church. Uh, we sit, we listen, we accumulate the facts, and we go on about our business, but nothing ever changes. God intends that his word have an impact upon our life in the sense of making us more like Jesus Christ. He intends that his word change us. <clears throat> you know, if the truths of scripture do not change us, they condemn us. I stand in condemnation if I'm not allowing the word of God to change, to transform, to, to make me into the image of Jesus Christ. If that's not taking place in my life, then, then this word that I teach, that I preach, <clears throat> that I claim to believe, then it condemns me. What is God's intention in having us apprehend these truths? Why, why does he give us these truths? What's his point? What's he after? Well, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, he tells us that his glory might be seen in his church. That's why God saved you, and he saved me, and he left us here in this world at this time 
so that through our lives, his glory might be seen. And then finally, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1 and following, Paul talks about doing. So we have knowing, being, and then doing. And he, he talks about doing in terms of how we should walk or how we should conduct ourselves in this world. He tells us that we need to walk worthy. We need to walk in holiness. We need to walk in love. We need to walk as light. We need to walk in wisdom. And he just talks about all of, of these different things that we need to do in the conduct of our life in this world. When we know what we need to know, when we are what we need to be, and when we do what we need to be doing, the end result is going to be that we live our lives to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's what Paul talked about at the very beginning of the book of Ephesians in verse number six, verse number 12, and verse number 14, to the praise of the glory of his grace. This same process, different terminology, different words, but it's the same process <coughs> that Paul speaks, speaks to the Romans about in Romans chapter six, seven, and eight. And today I wanna to talk about what we need to do by looking at Romans chapter 6 verses 12 really through 23 but we're only going to read up to verse number 14. <clears throat> Paul says therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body to obey it in the lusts thereof and do not offer any parts of it your body to sin as weapons for unrighteousness but as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not <coughs> rule, <coughs> rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. And let me say again, I'm sorry for the coughing, but I am still getting over this cold. And I hope that it, that that you can look beyond that to what I'm talking about today. <clears throat> I wanna talk about yielding our members, the members of our body to God. It seems to me that there are two views of the Christian life that can prove uh, debilitating to us in fulfilling the commands that are given to us in this section. The first view is that the Christian experience is an intellectual exercise in, in which we, we seek to understand the deep truths that are presented to us in God's word. We could go back to Romans 6, verses 1 through 11. That, that's some pretty deep theology. And, and so some people view the Christian life as a mental exercise in trying to understand that. And secondly, some people view the Christian life as an emotional thing. It is, it is, it is just emotional uh, in which we seek to understand, uh, in which we uh, enjoy and experience the, uh, the presence of Christ in our worship. And so they come to church not so much to learn anything, they come to church to feel something because that is their, their experience. And therefore, uh, the music is very important. Uh, uh, the onstage uh, happenings are very important to them, whether it's smoke or, or whatever else that takes place on stage, the lighting and all of that kind of stuff is, is part of the emotional experience and that is their Christianity. That's what they look forward to. It's really no different than going to say a, a rock concert, except <coughs> that this has a sort of spiritual twist to it and, and it touches them emotionally. And those are the views that we see uh, 
among Christian people as far as Christianity is concerned. But, but genuine Christianity can never be only an experience of our inner being, our intellect, intellect and our emotions. Not, not that those things are divorced from genuine Christianity. They certainly are not. But it can't be just that. God's intent is that what we know and what we feel be merged into a life that is lived in the marketplace of this world. That's what God's intent is. In the final analysis, our Christian life is not merely about what we know or about what we feel. If that is where our Christian, Christianity ends, then we've really kind of stopped halfway. Those truths must find expression in the marketplace. They need, they need to be lived out in our home, in our school, at work, in our neighborhood, among our friends, all of those things. And so the Apostle Paul talks about yielding ourselves to God. In fact, the word yield is used five times in this section, and it means <clears throat> to place at someone's disposal, to present something, to, to offer as a sacrifice. And Paul picks up this, this same idea again in Romans chapter 12 and verse number one, where, where he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So why does the Apostle Paul focus on the presentation or the yielding of our bodies to the Lord in these two sections? Well, he does so because when a person gets saved, when they come to faith in Christ, when they're born again, when they're regenerated, redeemed, all of the Bible words that are used, justified, when they get saved, sin is removed and banned from our spirit and our soul. The New Testament never uh, mentions sin as a problem in that area of our being. And what sin does, because it can no longer affect our, our spirit and our soul, it takes up residence or refuge in our flesh, our, our bodies. And from that refuge of our unredeemed flesh, sin seeks to take up strongholds in our life, a beachhead if you will, from which it can launch attacks against the work of God through us in this world. Maybe a stronghold of lust or uh, maybe eating disorders or pride or addictions or greed or misplaced priorities or anger or gossip or just m multiplied numbers of things that, that appeal to our flesh. <clears throat> and it takes up those strongholds and it gets a grip on us in those strongholds and it keeps us from being able to, to fully serve the Lord and fully display his glory for those who observe us in the world. The picture Paul is painting for us here is that both sin and God are looking for weapons to use in this battle of the ages between truth and error, between sin and righteousness. And God has ordained that it will be through our lives, through yours and mine, who know Christ as Savior, through our bodies, the bodies of his redeemed people, that is what God has ordained to use to accomplish his eternal work in this world. For example, <clears throat> David yielded himself to the Lord to, to stand before the giant with a slingshot. 
so that, as David said, the world will know that there is a God in Israel. <clears throat> David did that as a young man, <clears throat> as a shepherd. He yielded himself to the Lord. Nobody else in that army of Israel was going to do it, but David did it. And he yielded himself and the talents and the gifts and the abilities that he had to the Lord to fight against that giant and to win that battle. And God was glorified. And the world to this day, to this day, knows that there's a God in Israel. Another time, David yielded his body to sin in order to fulfill his lust for Bathsheba. And then he sought to uh, cover his guilt by signing the death warrant of Bathsheba's husband. He yielded his body just like we can yield our body to that which will bring glory to God or that which will bring shame to God and to ourselves. His awareness of what he had done is expressed in Psalm 51 where he asks for forgiveness. And in so doing, in David's uh, appeal for forgiveness, he mentions the parts of his body that have been affected by this sin. He talks about his eyes and about his mind, about his ears, about his heart, about his lips, about his mouth. He, he's talking about the various parts of his body the point is that in order for a believer to live out the life of Christ, there must be in our lives a point in time when we make a once-for-all presentation of our bodies to Christ as a conscious act of our will. I am giving my body to you. I'm giving the different parts of my body to you, and I will use them to bring honor, to bring glory to you, and not to fulfill the lusts of my own heart. That is why it is important that we know. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. It is important that we know the truths that exist in our life as a result of our salvation. It is important that we reckon or consider to be so, Romans chapter 6 and verse number 11, to count them to be so, to regard as being so, to calculate, to rely upon those facts of our existence. <clears throat> Paul says you are dead. He says in, in another place <clears throat> that, that sin cannot reign over you. It must not reign over you. The book of 1 John says sin will not reign over you. And it's important in the, in, in the process of, of growth in our spiritual life that we understand what God has done for us, that we comprehend that mentally, and then we, <clears throat> by the grace of God, pull that down into our lives so that we become what we know. And we reckon these facts into the various circumstances of our life. And then that we yield our bodies as tools for his service. And that, <clears throat> that once for all yielding of, our <coughs> yielding of our bodies will call upon us <clears throat> to make a day-by-day -day yielding of its various members as tools for God's use in building his kingdom and displaying his righteousness in a fallen world. <clears throat> now, in concluding this section, Paul gives us three reasons why 
why we should yield our body and its members to Christ. And I want to go over them quickly in closing. <clears throat> First of all, in Romans chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Paul said, For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Absolutely not. First of all, we ought to yield our bodies because of the favor that God has shown us. Why should I do what God has asked of me? Well, Paul says, because he has bestowed upon me, upon you, the favor of grace. And grace is basically an unmerited favor. It is something you and I do not deserve. And he bestows upon us his grace. Even though you and I deserve from God nothing but his condemnation. But he has offered to us instead salvation, redemption, forgiveness, restoration, sanctification, relationship, <clears throat> eternal life, abundant life, all of these things through Christ. One would think that in the life of any believer, the answer to why I should give my body as a living sacrifice to him, that answer ought to be self-evident because of the favor he has shown to us. The second thing, second reason Paul gives in this passage is because of the freedom God has given us. He's shown us great favor and he has given us great freedom. In verse number 16, he says to us, don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, either of sin leading to death or of abundance leading to righteousness. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart the pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. And having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. I am using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. God has given us great freedom. Our founding fathers believed, and rightly so, that it is the very nature of man to yearn for freedom. But at the same time, there is a sinful bent in mankind towards bondage, whether it be in terms of government or in terms of our spiritual life. I know in, in the battles <clears throat> that we have fought, uh, in the Middle East, uh, many of the, quote, experts that were interviewed said that, that there are, are people groups that can't handle liberty. They aren't used to that, and so they prefer uh, a dominant figure in, in ruling over them. Well, that's the way we all are in terms of sin. We have a tendency toward that. But the truth is that, that if you and I do not fight for liberty, we will be condemned to slavery. And we're seeing that take place uh, in, in Ukraine at this very moment. Through the work of Christ in salvation, believers have been freed from the bondage of sin in both legal terms and in the practice of their lives if they will embrace that. And that's what Paul is appealing to here. 
The promise of sin is freedom. You know that's true, and so do I. You know, if you do this, you'll be free. You can do what you want to do. It's, you know, you know, take that drink or or smoke that uh, dope or, uh, you know, take this or do that or something else. And the promise is freedom. You're, you're, you're free from all of the, the barriers that keep you from doing what you want to do. That's the promise of sin. The reality of sin is slavery. It enslaves. The Bible tells us this. Remember the story of the prodigal son in, in trying to, <clears throat> to find himself. The Bible says he actually lost himself. And that's, that takes place even today. You may be listening to me today and you have maybe 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago set out to find yourself. I remember growing up in high school, that was a big word, you know, I gotta find myself. And oftentimes in seeking to find ourselves, we lose ourselves. And we, we give ourselves up to the bondage of the sin that we thought that we were promised would set us free. And, and Paul says that the fact is that whatever it is that we yield to is our master, no matter what else we say. And all of us, every single one of us, is yielding to something or someone, and it is our master. Much to his amazement, the prodigal son found that, that true freedom was only found when he yielded to the will of his father. And, and in a spiritual sense, the same is true with us. The implication of these verses is that the believer should, should find as much delight in his life in yielding to the Lord as they were delighted to yield to sin before they got saved. Why should I yield my members to the Lord? Because of the freedom God has given to us. God, God does not seek to enslave us in terms of, of, of a bondage that is uh, restricting. God seeks to, to free us from our sin and enable us to, to live a life that he ordained we live to begin with, a life of freedom. We are free to serve the God who made us. And then finally, we ought to <clears throat> yield our lives to the Lord because of the fruit that God desires that we bear. Verses 21 through 23, Paul says, so what fruit was produced then from the things you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now, since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul asked the question. It's a good question. It's a question you ought to answer and I ought to answer. What, what benefit, <clears throat> what benefit did we reap from the things that now we look back and we're ashamed of? What was the benefit? Paul said they all led to death. There was no fruit there. There was no, no benefit for us really. Look around at our world. Look at your unsaved friends. Maybe your own family. And understand the truth of that statement. You know people who are stubbornly clinging to lifestyles that have the stench of death all over them. And maybe you've said it about, about someone in your, your own circle of friends or family or acquaintances. You know, they, they need to stop this or they're going to die. 
because you can see that their lifestyle has the stench of death all over it. <clears throat> you know, the, the reality of sin is to live a harder life. The Bible says in the Old Testament that the way of the transgressor is hard. The, the reality of sin is to live a harder life. It's to die a quicker death. Why, why would any believer want to engage in that which the scriptures warn us seeks only our spiritual demise? Why, as a believer, would you want to involve yourself in that sort of thing? However we choose to live our lives, however we choose to do it, is going to be revealed in the fruit of the life that is produced. God, through Christ's work alone, has freed us from sin, <clears throat> and he has made us his servants so that the fruit of our lives will be holiness, and the end result of our life will be eternal life. Paul says, here in Romans 3.23, or 6.23, a very <clears throat> famous verse, he says that life will reward us all with wages. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. At the end of the day, we're going to receive what we have earned. I want you to notice too, the Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23 is written to believers. It's not written to the unsaved. Paul's talking to believers. If we choose not to know, if we choose not to reckon or consider, if, if we choose not to yield, then the fruit of our life will end in death. But God has gifted us with the prospect of that which will endure for eternity through our relationship with Christ in salvation. What a privilege. What an opportunity. And the question for each of us on this Lord's Day, who are believers in Christ, is how will we choose to live our life. We live in a corrupt world. And in that corrupt world, Peter says, we are to shine as lights. Will you? Will that be your choice? I pray that it will be today. Father, I thank you today for your word, for its truth, for what it teaches us how it teaches us to live in a world that is opposed to you, to those of us who believe, to the life that you have called us to, to the gospel that you have commanded us to preach. I pray that we might shine as lights and that we might know the things that we need to know and that we might reckon them or apply them or take them into consideration in the choices that we, we have to make in our life. And then that we would yield our lives and our members day by day to the honor and glory of Christ. And as a result, sing forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Lord, may it be so. I pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening today. I pray that you'll take the truths of this message and apply them to your heart. And if you don't know the Lord, then I ask that you contact us and let us talk to you. We're not high pressure. We're not going to dog you to death about it, but we're going to share with you the good news of the gospel and how you can know Christ in a personal way. I pray that you'll contact us and let us know and let us help you in that regard. Have a good day.